Hey guys, and welcome back to the Cover 2 Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Moonlight Swami, alongside Bangle, the Bangles fan, wearing his snapback Bangles hat because he's a Bangles fan. All three inaccurate statements. Did I maybe say one three? of them is accurate. Yeah, maybe, I'm not may, sure. Maybe one. Not maybe, sure. maybe, maybe two. Maybe two. I think... Mm, one of them was certainly inaccurate. The others were uh, questionable. Okay, okay. Well, I can accept that. <laughs> but I am wearing the Super Bowl Patriots hat because obviously I am a Jaguars fan. No, um, but we are live for episode number nine of the Cover 2 podcast. How is everybody doing today? We have a very fun show where we're going to go over the postseason games that just occurred. Our thoughts, reactions, we'll be discussing the XFL. And we're also going to fix the Browns because we are as qualified as some of those people in the front office to make decisions on this matter, right? I think that's... Honestly. Honestly. I mean, maybe not today for Bangle, but he'll get there. Regardless, we're going to go through okay. all of this stuff. <laughs> we're going to go through all of this stuff. So and... trying to figure out this lighting issue. I look like I'm... I don't even know. You look like you're a uh, a very depressed soul today. <laughs> Just with, my with, nose is sticking out with a fuse box panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe I should upgrade my lighting setup. Yes, this uh, this podcast will be throughout the entire off season because there ain't no off season when it comes to football. We are always in season, even during the dead months of July when nothing is happening, because we can make stuff up. So, let's start off with the postseason games. Let's talk about those Jacksonville Jaguars. And the, that, that was an interesting game, wasn't it? I, uh... You know, I enjoyed it, but I don't... Even though I did take Jacksonville, I said New England would win it. How could you expect them not to? Yeah, I know you picked them just because yeah. you, you were riding the hot hand and you, even though you didn't really believe it, you just wanted to, to pick them to pick them, but... Yeah. Let's talk... You, there's two good Patriots are. Yeah. Um, I will say one thing. The Jaguars did a pretty good job of limiting the, the ground game. Um, James White was really inefficient on the ground, even though he did have the rushing touchdown. Um, Tom Brady's numbers make things look a little bit worse. Oh, my God. Things are changing here. Oh, my I, God. I want to get this better. It's really bothering me. I'm watching this. I apologize for the change in scenery but look i have three different cameras on you right now and this is just freaking me out because <laughs> i have the skype i have the obs and then i have a mini skype because it's stupid so <laughs> <laughs> so i just see three images of you flying this across is, the screen this is slightly better yes that's much better actually with with the lighting yes so Deion lewis nine carries 34 yards one of them was for 18 the jaguars did a pretty good job of bottling that up but in all honesty, they really couldn't do much against Tom Brady the entire game. Even in man coverage in the first half, um, they pressured Tom Brady a total of nine times on 42 dropbacks. Which, I mean, that's that's not acceptable. That's 21%. That is terrible for the team that was second in sacks in the league. Yes, they padded their stats against the terrible lines of the Texans and the Colts in four games, but they did. It's, it's, a, it's a good group of players, you know, yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. And Dante Fowler Jr. Did get two sacks, but I mean, overall, did you hear Calais Campbell's name that entire game? Maybe the, uh, and you hate to say it because he had such a productive season, even at what? 33, but I don't know. Uh, it's pretty deep in the season at that point for a 33 year old. If that is his age, which I'm pretty sure that it is. He's 31. 31? Still. Really? Still. Yeah. He, wow, uh, why do I feel like he's older? He didn't do a ton against Pittsburgh. Um, he hadn't had a sack in a long time. If I'm looking at this correctly through um, on ESPN, the last game that he had a sack came against the Texans on December 17th which means that he played five games without a sack. After Not great 14, numbers. After having 14 and a half on the season against San Francisco, Tennessee, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, New England. 
that interesting. He he definitely was not impactful in the way that you'd expect him to be. The way that he's played this season and the way that they have played overall um, on that defensive front. But the run defense, I think that was pretty pretty valuable. I think they did a good job there. But no pressure on Brady. Um, he picked them apart. I, I personally thought the game plan was terrible offensively for a large portion of the game from New England. Um, there were way too many swing screens and passes into the flats on third and short. I think it was just a, an ultra-conservative approach when they didn't need to be. If it was third and long, I get it. But third and four, third and three, doing these quick screens and swing passes and misdirection stuff... I mean, you could tell it wasn't going to work. It just, what do you think about the way that they played in the first half versus the second half? Anything, any notes from that game that caught your eye? It was closer for sure in the first half. And I thought it was, they weren't really playing the New England Patriot brand football, if you will. And, you know, Jacksonville was putting up points and, you know, the personnel of New England hasn't been as good as it has been in the past, you know, on both sides of the ball. But they came out in the second half, in my opinion, and they kind of played that New England Patriot brand football, scored points when they needed to, stopped the Jaguars when they needed to, and obviously came out on top. You could say just barely, but I think that wasn't as close of a game as the score would indicate in the second half. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, One thing to note, obviously, Rob Gronkowski was out for that entire second half with a concussion. And Brady statistically over the course of his career has been atrocious with Rob Gronkowski off the field in comparison on it. Um, It just, it's not his bread and butter, and he was fantastic. He carved up the best secondary in football without a shadow of a doubt. Um, With, I mean, whether they were playing cover three, whether they are playing man-to-man, it really didn't matter. A.J. Boye who came in as Bleacher Report's number one graded corner this season, allowed two touchdowns to Antonio Brown. One of them he got beat pretty cleanly on. The other one was just a great play. But Brandon Cooks ate him alive in this game. Doesn't have the speed to compete, that type of receiver. He is a technician. He is not a speed guy. I was very surprised they didn't put Jalen Ramsey on Cooks, but I guess they wanted him on Hoga. I don't don't get that matchup. For someone who moves around as much as Jalen Ramsey does I would have expected that but you could just tell that he was when he was playing off coverage that cushion was getting eaten up and he was respecting the deep ball so much that the comeback was always open um Cook six for a hundred he did drop a perfectly placed touchdown against Barry Church and Barry Church decided to celebrate after getting beat by about uh four or five steps which would have been about a 45 yard touchdown And Cooks dropped in. He actually actively celebrated like a Madden character. Um, But let's talk a little bit about Danny Amendola. He made a huge play. Huge play. He made huge plays. The Patriots always have one of those guys. You know, not a superstar during the season, but they come alive in the playoff. That's not to say that Julian Edelman hasn't been a good player, but last year in the Super Bowl, he made an unbelievable catch. And yeah. Danny Amendola's catch last week, because he made a one bigger one than most, I would say. Yes. Um, it wasn't anything to that Julian Edelman degree. It wasn't the Super Bowl. Stakes were not as high. I, I would say that the catch luck wasn't on as good. Edelman's catch was a lot higher as well. This was a lot more. Yeah, but that was a lot of concentration. Opinion. I mean, if, yeah. if you really look at that play, that's fantastic from Julian Edelman. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to let you talk here for a second. I'm going to let my cat in. She's making a ton of noise. It, it is what it is. I can't really provide more uh, more insight than that. It uh, has to happen. has to happen. Okay. I, I, will, I will add some more insight while you go deal with your cat. But the way that the, the Patriots played in that second half, it was just a – it was a different brand of football. It was like they knew that the Jaguars couldn't put anything together offensively, and they were extremely conservative. They played the field position game, and – it just, there really wasn't any way for the Jaguars to put any points on the board come that second half. Um, Brady was excellent. Amendola was excellent. Um, Miles Jack picking the pocket of Dion Lewis was one of the best plays I've seen in this postseason. That was phenomenal. And to see him do that so effortlessly 
I understand that he probably wasn't down when they ruled him down. It was a bang bang play. I understand why they called it down, but that is uh, that was a potentially game changing play. But it really didn't matter because the Jaguars couldn't do anything offensively, and the Patriots dared them to try. And the Jaguars mismanaged clock the entire second half. They weren't snapping the ball inside 10 seconds a lot of the time. It was a lot of first down runs, second down deep play action passes. They were going nowhere fast, and they did it cons- consistently the entire second half. I mean, let's just call a spade a sp- spade. Blake Bortles sucks. He is not a starting caliber quarterback. You got it. You got to slow down. Blake Bortles might be the best quarterback we've seen if for a while. That's, that's what I'll say. For a while. <sighs> Consistent talent. Poise. Poise is what it comes down to. Dude has so little poise. <laughs> he he makes no you don't you're 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 discounting his abilities. He's got he's got so much poise. Pocket presence, he's awareness tall. of the moment. He's tall. Hey, you know what else he can do? Throw the ball ish, far ish. Yep, he's tall. He can throw the ball far ish. Um but Robbie is is probably, in my opinion, the worst starting quarterback in the NFL this year. Um, he's he's really. I'm. I guess you could consider the the trio in Denver to be worse. I guess that would be the only grouping that I would say produced anyone worse. But because I don't think Paxton Lynch, Trevor Simeon, or Brock Osweiler have any redeeming qualities to them. I guess Simeon actually. Has I know. I'm trying to think. I'm like. I would say. I would say. I would take a. Trevor Simeon first couple weeks of the season over Brock Osweiler or not Brock Osweiler. Well, over yes, but, yeah, yeah, over, over Robbie. Yeah, I, I just think he limits the playbook too much. He doesn't have the physical tools. He has the poise. He has the aggressive. You know, who has the physical tools. Josh Allen, Blake Bortles. Oh, he does too. Robbie, it, it's Blake, a, it's Bortles. amazing that in that Steelers game, he literally would hit the top of his drop and then would tr- immediately scramble. He wouldn't even bother looking downfield. That's, Sounds like uh, Johnny Manziel, Texas A&M. Yeah, that's how little, um, that's how little confidence he had, and he actually admitted that he's not even a natural thrower, which, that is, <laughs> what does that mean? It means that he is someone who doesn't have a natural throwing motion. You know, it doesn't just come easy. You know, you see guys, you see these well, quarterbacks no, with over the over the top motion is unnatural in like actual definition throwing a baseball is an unnatural motion yeah same thing with a football your arm's designed to go underhand yeah. so but no one has a natural well throwing motion. you see rogers you see newton you see lamar yeah, jackson they, you see those guys they just flick their wrist and the ball comes off but mm-hmm. bortles it's such a long extended motion you can tell he's not comfortable it's not something that just comes with ease to him that he's obviously had to work on it but you're not a good quarterback if that's the case he's just not and, you're not good, you're great. And let's be honest, he limits that playbook so much. I mean, a real quarterback, they make that a real game, they might win that. There's no guarantee because New England plays it differently, but the way that Blake Bortles played in that game, he he didn't play terribly for his own right, but you knew that he couldn't do anything for most of that game. And he put up some decent stats, but... I mean, when you needed him, he was as expected. Let's uh let's transition over to that uh that Minnesota Philadelphia game real quick, because <laughs> I don't think I don't I don't want to talk about this for too long. I, I don't want to talk about it at all. I just want to just quickly say, my God, th- those Vikings were overmatched play calling wise. Um. Keenum was under Ballers pressure. Really good. Keenum was under pressure forty eight percent of the time. That's on. Unass- that's just you're not that's doing ridiculous. anything. You, you're. It's not. You can't do anything. Um, one of his interceptions was tipped at the line. You know his arm was hit. Um, yeah, Chris Long came off that left edge. Yeah, he hit both of his arms, <laughs> which yeah, is yeah, which is really long. impressive. Um, Foles looked excellent. He did. Um, I remember on that flea flicker, uh, he threw a touchdown to Torrey Smith, and that that ball placement was perfect. It was mwah, magnifique. It, it was it was beautiful. But um, the the Eagles took advantage of the aggressiveness of the Vikings. 
That's really all there is to it. They tried to blitz him a lot. He shredded their blitz. He attacked their aggressiveness off of play action. Uh, Harrison Smith tried to jump a route on Zach Ertz, who was doing an out and up. He bit on the out. The up came, and he was open for a huge gain. There was just nothing that the Vikings could do game plan-wise. They were outmatched from the get, and that's really it. I mean, Nick Foles looked good. Th there's no doubting that, but this is not the team that you're going to... This is not the team that we've seen all this season, and this is not the team that we're going to see moving forward, most likely. Um, the attacking of the aggressive nature of the Vikings is not something that you can do against New England because they're not like that. New England is a much more passive team on the defensive side of the ball. There's a reason that they haven't had a defensive touchdown in four years. But they've been top five in scoring defense repeatedly. They don't allow a ton of points. They don't make a ton of mistakes. Um, Doug Peterson, though, runs a lot of RPOs. And we saw what happened week number one against the Kansas City Chiefs, what happens when teams run a ton of RPOs and they bunch sets and they do a bunch of uh, confusing things to defenses. It's going to be a chess match. That's all I can say about it. We're not going to talk too much about the Super Bowl matchup, but any notes from that game, I it just it was I was in shock most of the game. It just I did not expect it. You know, I got I got a on Twitter everyone messaging me about it. I slept on the Eagles. I don't think that I slept on the Eagles so much as I expected more from the Vikings and they just didn't perform. They were completely outmatched at every level. Uh, defense has proven to be elite. That was never the question. But really, what was the make or break in this game, aside from the great play calling from the Eagles, which it was very good, Nick Foles played like the 27 touchdowns to two interceptions Pro Bowl Nick Foles of, of a few years ago. Maybe even more than a few at this point. Maybe we'll call it several. But I don't know it was who this player is. Yeah, so about in the weird mix between a few and several. <laughs> um, I, I don't – no, you can't predict that, all right? <laughs> well, you can't predict a career average guy to come in and play like the best quarterback in the NFL, making every throw, doing it at a high level, reading defenses. Minnesota got carved up. Yeah. You know, I will say one thing. This game was better than any game he ever had. That 2013 oh, yeah. season. 353 yards passing, something along those lines. 352. He had seven incompletions. Yeah. Um, I just want to say one thing about it. Nick Foles 2013 is the most overrated season in NFL history. Um, he, oh, threw, well, yeah, but you, you, he threw something you like look at 20 dropped numbers. interceptions. Yeah. So but, it, it's not like he was actually good at not throwing interceptions. He just got really, really lucky, which is unprecedented. But Reminds this, me of it. Different Philadelphia quarterback. Uh, yeah, but we're not going to talk about Donovan McNabb today. Uh, oh, yeah? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, this was uh, Nick Foles' poise. There was a play where the pocket condensed, and it condensed, and it condensed, and he got grabbed, and he kept his eyes downfield, and he threw a dime. I mean, he threw just a perfect pass for a touchdown. And I was just watching thinking, oh, my God, Nick Foles, how did you just do that? How did you have that poise? Oh, my God, that was spectacular. I'm so proud of him. Because it's just when the pocket condenses like that, most quarterbacks freak out. I mean, there was literally he was surrounded with maybe a yard's worth of space in any direction. It was that tight. And he was getting grabbed. And he still had the poise to come out and fire a deep pass. Yeah, and, well, and the Vikings' it. defensive line, I mean, they're not bad. And, you know, when you have the playmakers on that D-line the way that they do, Linval Joseph, Everson Griffin, being a few of them, Brian Robeson, Hook'em Horns. Um, but, Daniel yeah, Hunter. they're – Yeah, Daniel Hunter's another one. Um, but, yeah, they're going to collapse pockets. They are. They're gonna. They but they didn't yeah. do it enough. And even when they did, as you just exclaimed, a collapsed pocket is only so much to a quarterback that doesn't care at all about it. Yeah. Made plays, and uh, I mean, there's nothing much else to say about that game, in my opinion. You know what that play reminded me of? What's that? Sam Bradford, Week One. 
the way that, you know, because he was obviously the former Eagle, the way that he handled those condensed pockets and that pressure was very Sam Bradford-esque. And that's one of the reasons that I love Sam Bradford as a quarterback is that he has that ability to just deal with pressure in a way that a lot of quarterbacks don't. Um, it's part of the reason he gets injured, though. But that Vikings front, they could not generate enough pressure against that Eagles offensive line, which is why they blitzed so much, and the blitz has failed miserably. I think Foles was like 11 for 13 passing against the blitz for like 188 yards, something ridiculous like that. I mean... They threw a lot of quick stuff, too. Yeah, And but, Minnesota didn't adapt. They never adapted. Yeah. Their zone stayed the same. Um, and they just weren't playing well. When you, it was when you such blitz, a weird game. When you blitz against RPOs and you have one-on-one with blocking, you're in trouble. That's all there is to it. You have to play a little bit more conservative against that type of thing because you're not going to stop them before the ball gets out. It's just, it doesn't happen. So... That means that it's going to be an an Eagles and Patriots Super Bowl. We're going to discuss that next week. For now, let's talk very briefly about the XFL. Very briefly, but yes. Uh, XFL is coming back. Vincent Kennedy McMahon announcement today. Vincent Kennedy McMahon. There you go. I wasn't going to put the effort in to, to saying that. I'm a wrestling fan. I don't, I... Maybe maybe a, a long time ago for me, but yes, at one point. So, yeah, uh, 2020, it's uh, – I'm very conflicted on it. I think it could be cool. Um, the ideas were, first off, that they'd like to get the games to about two hours in length, try to cut out halftime. Try to cut down on penalties. Um, no cheerleaders. No uh, players who have any arrests on their. The record. cheerleaders is the worst part. Well, yeah, that's definitely a, a downside. But it's like uh, a huge hit. Yeah, it was half my intrigue. <laughs> um, uh, gonna, maybe even more than half. It's to be gonna, honest. What are you? Thirteen. Uh, it's gonna. Uh, hold, no, I just don't care for this this budget whack thing that they call football over at the XFL. With nicknames on the back of jerseys. Well, they're not doing that. No they're, rules. They're not doing that. They are going to limit penalties um, because they're going to create more simple rules. They're not going to have no rules, obviously. They're going to simplify the rules. Yeah, I exaggerated, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't remember what the original XFL was, um, except for he hate me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's going to start with eight teams. They're not doing a franchise model, at least yet. Um, no locations have been announced and they are also going to mandate that player stand for the national anthem. You, you hoping I've comment on that? No, I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. I, I think the look that we just both had at our cameras says it all about that. I don't think that's a good marketing strategy. That's all I'm going to say. Um, also, or is, it, or is it the best one that they could possibly do? I don't think it's a good one, honestly. It just doesn't feel right. Um, but the one about the no uh, the no arrests, I don't think they realize how many players that's they going to arrested. disqualify. Yeah. <laughs> Mar- Marlon Humphrey today yes. was arrested for stealing a $15 iPhone charger. From and, a frat you know, house. They, they say $15. they iPhone charger is like $180. Just phone no, I, I think it was a cord, but it was yeah. just, yeah. I was just get, yes, kidding. I, I, I know. Markups. Yes. Uh, but yeah, that's that's an arrest. He stayed overnight in a prison, or a jail, I should say, because of that. Well, it is Alabama. You know how they are. Um, Whoa. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm yeah, kidding. Yeah, all right. Look, I've been okay. writing. I've been writing a lot about the civil rights movement from the 1950s and 60s. Cut me some slack. Um, well, what year was uh, black and white marriage, interracial marriage, legalized? Sorry, I was focusing on sports. 1966. Um, you have a poster of that on your wall, don't you? Yeah, this wall has a lot going on. No, the other one. <laughs> yeah, you want to you want to see? Because there's no, nothing. A, it's okay. It's okay. There's nothing in any of these. <laughs> Well, that's just weird. Um, I just, I know things. Uh Uh-huh. I'm sure you do. So. (laughs) Someone someone can Google it. I'm correct, probably. You probably are. I I, I don't. 
as long as it's legal, it really doesn't matter to me what year exactly in the 1960s. But uh, fun fact, Jackie Robinson was Rosa Parks before Rosa Parks. He got um, he got charged with insubordination when he was part of the U.S. military in 1943 because he refused to move to the back of a segregated bus. He was cleared of all charges and was honorably discharged from the military, but he did that in 1943. No. More power to him. Um, so, now that I shared my little tidbit of knowledge for today, XFL, yay or nay, think it could be any good. Eight teams, no franchise model. It's not going to be good because of, well, to me at least, because if there's no future, then like, why does it matter? It's going to be a, a gimmick as it was when it was, you know, actually running. Yeah. It's going to be, you know, mix it up from the NFL for those who want a different style, a different brand. I don't think it's going to be very successful. I think it's going to be a gimmick. And I'm really not interested in watching any of it. And it really, maybe I'll, I'm probably going to watch the, you know, the inaugural episode back episode, if you will. Um, Because I know if there's one thing Vince McMahon knows how to do, it's put on a show. Oh, yeah. But I'm not so interested in that, to be honest. What? No no cheerleaders? I don't know. I don't know if they're going to get me to watch. What player would get you to watch? Ooh. um, Well, I don't know, because all the players that I like that don't play in the NFL are old now. Well, so like, keep, I, keep in mind, the start time would be end of January for the season. It's a 10-game season. End of January start. Well, the first name that popped in my head was Vince Young. But Vince Young's also old now. And then I thought, oh, let's let's change it up. And then I thought Troy Smith, and that one makes no sense. How about Tim Tebow? Nah. Tim Tebow wouldn't get me to watch. I'm, <laughs> he just wouldn't. I've never been a huge that. Tebow fan. He was so painful to watch. <laughs> Until yeah, the fourth I, quarter. End of the fourth quarter, that's when things got a little interesting. Um, I don't never like Johnny football. Yeah. Being a Texas against Texas A and M. Hate Texas A and M. Never liked, you know, Johnny football. I, I don't care for it at all. And uh he was never actually good in any way as a quarterback, as a passer. Wow. What about uh what about Kellen Moore. What about, give me a name that makes sense for me to watch. I'm not tuning in for Kellen Moore. Well, Kellen Moore, obviously, at Boise State, was very entertaining. What about those college guys who come from systems that obviously didn't translate but could be really entertaining? Let's say Bryce Petty ends up out of the league in a year. Would he be someone that you might be interested if they're playing in air raid style football? (laughs) I don't know how I can explain it. There's almost no name you could give me Robert that would make Griffin me real interest. I wouldn't. I don't. I don't care. I really just don't. Wow. Um, I I just wanted to see if there was a name. I mean, I'm probably gonna watch it because football is football. Um, if there's if there's young players coming directly out of college, seniors who were on the cusp of being in the NFL and didn't make it. Oh, I, I'm sure there will be. Those are the guys it's who better I'm option be than the CFL. Yeah, those are the guys who I'm gonna be watching. And I'm sure I'll tune into more games than I'm giving, but I'm saying there's no big name they could get to make me want to watch. And I'm sure Johnny Manziel will be in it. I'm sure he will Calvin be. Calvin Johnson. Or Brief Sin. Yeah, Calvin <laughs> Johnson is back to the XFL. Yes. That was his holdout. It wasn't because of injury or leaving the Lions. It was He knew about the XFL, and he wanted to be on a team, and he wanted to be fresh for his comeback, despite doctors saying, you can't play in the NFL anymore. Well, yeah, because he didn't say anything about the XFL. Exactly. Loopholes. Loopholes. Um, Let's move on from this ridiculous topic. It'll be interesting to see. There's two years. We'll see what happens between now and 2020. Um, But I think we should put our GM caps on. I'll spin my, uh, well, actually, I'll probably keep my AFC North hat right where it is, considering the team that we're addressing at this moment. I spun mine around. So I put my GM cap on. Fair. As we are going to be fixing the Cleveland Browns today. The Cleveland Browns have two picks in the first round in the top five picks. They have, what did they say, four picks in the top 40? Let's get four a full rundown. Four of... picks in the top 35. They have 33, they have uh, 36. 33, 36, 1, and 4. 
as of right now because they have the Texans first rounder and second rounder, their own first and second rounder. Um, it's going to be really interesting. Let me just... How do you time out somebody on here for a minute? So you're trying to get... Oh, all right. I would have got it. It's okay. Um, so let me pull up... The, did you pull up the draft picks? I'm trying to find the ones that are updated. And I... Because I don't... Every mock draft that's out there is one round. And I want every pick. Okay, here's a web from the Cleveland Browns. I'll send it to you on uh, Twitter. Um, awesome. It is all 12 draft picks from Cleveland.com. So that is uh, the perfect place to to look at this. But so they have picks number one, number four, number 33, number 35, number 63, number 65, number 103, 125, 140, 161, 179, and 220. All right, so, we can definitely go through this and even throw out some speculative names, a couple guys that could fit up near the top, and then maybe you know we'll throw out a name or two or a position group or, yeah. or what have you for players that could potentially fall in that range. We'll do free agency. Um, Let's start with free agency. not even agency. sure who Brown's free agents are. Are as far as players that to resign? I have the list. I One have of us all came of these prepared. resources. Yes, I came prepared because I knew we would be doing this. Yes. Um, so here are the free agents for the Browns for this season. Marcus Martin, left guard. LeVar Edwards, 4-3 defensive end. Tank Carter, inside backer. Isaiah Crowell, that's the big one of the mm. main group. Jamie Meter is a restricted free agent. Josh Keyes is an RFA. Um, Austin Reeder, Dan Vitale, Kevin Hogan, Matt Hazel, Chris Baker, or Chris Barker, and Josh Gordon are ERFAs. So they are... I don't think they have really any chance of leaving those guys, th those last grouping, unless they uh, aren't brought back. But Josh Gordon's going to be back most likely the way that he played. If he's back on track, they're not getting rid of him. Um, he was dominant to end He looks very good. And I think he, despite all the suspension stuff, I think he's really excited to play football and yeah. do it for the Cleveland Browns. He well, loves yeah. Cleveland. Yeah. I was very impressed with him. The fact that he could come in and play so well against Casey yeah. Hayward in his first game back was spectacular. Hayward is one of the best in football. Right he now. had the, you know, arguably the best season of any cornerback this year. Yeah, I mean he was he was up there, top five at the very worst. Um, so that's uh that was really impressive. But that's who the Browns have as current uh, free agents. Any of them you don't want to bring back? I think there are a few. I think there are a few names I'm going to throw out right now. Yeah. Uh, we have first one is not really a huge name, but Jane Meter. There's no reason to bring him back. I there agree. just isn't. Yeah. No I reason. Agree. With the emergence of Larry Ogunjobi, you have Danny Shelton. You have the Caleb defensive Brantley. lines. Caleb Brantley is an awesome player. I still don't know how he. Well, I, I know how he went to the Browns, and that's because uh, Off there the was issue, Yeah, issues with with the draft, but. He was a guy that could project as a first, maybe second rounder in terms of ability. Yeah. Ended up not working out. He falls to the Browns. The Browns have such a good, young, we'll say core. Because yeah, on the defensive do. line, you look at Miles Garrett. Despite what anyone wants to tell you, Miles Garrett had a very good season. Yes. Excellent. Played injured, put up a fantastic uh, set of numbers, and uh, advanced statistics perform really well as well. Yeah. Uh, if you look further into it, Emmanuel Agba is a good player. Agba, top another, five another in edge. tackles at or behind the line of scrimmage over the past two seasons in the NFL. That's phenomenal. And then, of course, we yeah. did talk about the interior, the defensive line. Danny Shelton's one of the best nose tackles in football, and Larry Ogunjobi continues to get better and better and better over and the course. We saw him at Charlotte yeah. and then all the way through, yeah, I'm saying, but each year. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So he continues to get better. So yeah. Lord knows what a second year in the NFL will do for him. So. I mean, you look at that defensive line. Caleb Brantley, as a rotational defensive tackle, if he can get better, oh yeah, that and is then, a really good group. No need for a meter. And then you get to the linebackers. Add on top of that, you have Jamie Collins, you have Christian Kirksey, you have Joe Schobert. Those are three talented players at that linebacker level. Even yeah, if Joe Schobert's the guy that led the league in, in tackles. Yeah, tied I mean, for it. yeah, I mean, there's a reason that this team was one of the best run defenses in football. When Agbo went out, they got worse. That, that's just what happened. But 
I mean, he missed the final month of the season. He still was top five in tackles for loss at or behind the line of scrimmage over the past two years. That's that's really impressive to miss that much time. Even a month, it's still, you'd think someone would have eclipsed him, but no one was able to. That's how dominant he's been in his first two seasons. Uh, sack numbers aren't there, but with those linebackers, um, Collins, he's a, he's a chess piece. I mean, he's a guy who you can blitz off the edge, you can put him at edge rusher, you can put him at the inside backer position if you want, 4-3 uh, back or whatever you want to do. Uh, Greg Williams' scheme doesn't do anybody any justice, but except for the fact that they're more aggressive, but um, they have talent. They have a lot of talent, and they have a lot of guys locked up long term. They have 17 players under contract through 2020 right now, which is... Tank Carter's a guy that probably doesn't need to come back. Yeah, I, I wouldn't bring very back... Effective. I wouldn't bring back uh, Marcus Martin either, unless you can get him for a minimal contract. I mean, these he, are... Was he, was he a second-round pick by the Niners? I feel like center? he was. I, I'm not sure. I feel, like, I feel like a second-rounder he was. But... I mean, outside of that, I'm fine with bring back Danny Vitale and the other guy. Other He's ERFAs. a decent fullback. Yeah. Um, Cason Williams has Vital. already been signed. It's Danny Vitale. Yeah, Dick Vitale. Yes, I know, but um, Cason Williams has already been brought back. Williams was interesting on the Seahawks for a while. Made some really big plays. Um, but that's really it, and the Browns have all the cap space in the world. They have... $110 million in cap space, the second most in the NFL. So taking a look at that defense, you have Brian Body Calhoun at nickel, very good player. Jason McCourty, career resurgence. He's still not young. Old, yeah. Little, little concerning. Jamar Taylor, he held up decently considering he was asked to do so much without the physical profile to do it. Um, definitely a player who isn't exactly replaceable because of contract but you might want to be able to add someone in that mix safety is a disaster with the way that they use to real peppers um, but Derek kindred had a decent season kindred was excellent in run defense and he was an abomination in coverage <laughs> god he was terrible every single in the box every single play i saw from kindred when he was in coverage was a touchdown i felt like he gave up 30 touchdowns this season alone it was terrible <laughs> That's just a awful. straight. I, I've seen him make interceptions in over the deep middle. I, maybe yeah. maybe two. I know, but he's just yeah. it's so bad. And and Drabil Peppers is obviously out of position. That's a guy who I would prefer being manned up in money in, money back tight ends. Yeah, I'd rather him be a money backer of sorts. I mean, you have a lot of defensive players who can do good things for them, but together they have the holes. Obviously, Collins was out for most of the season. Um, they didn't have a true deep safety. Peppers just doesn't have the experience or the instincts to be a deep safety, especially in cover three and cover one. He never one. will. Uh, did you see him? He, my, he was lining up 25 yards off the line of scrimmage. It was terrible. As a deep safety. It was awful. He was 10 yards out of the first down marker. It was terrible. Just awful. I mean, the Chiefs do that as well, but that's a mm, whole separate issue. Um, that was so deep. In the yeah. clips that I've seen. Oh, yeah. It, so it was, deep. It was really bad. You want him maybe 10 to 12 yards closer to the line of scrimmage than he was. And that's way too many. Maybe four or five. It's like, all right, but like 12? Yeah. Uh, Kindred uh, played, I don't know how many exact snaps, but he allowed four touchdowns. And he was not good. <laughs> really not good. They picked on him uh, in coverage. It was, it was, it was pretty bad. Um, to be when you went out of like 90 players, he was like 15th in coverage snaps per reception, which is bad. Um, but so safety is a position of need. Um, Kindred, like we said, he's not a bad player. He's just not a versatile player. Uh, Peppers out of position. I mean, they must respect the hell, hell out of him to put him in those positions that they must respect his range or something to value him in a role that is so far out of his capacity. But it, it makes them miss a guy like Deshaun Gibson a lot. Um, yeah. So with that money, let's start on the offensive side. Let, let, we'll get back to defense in a minute because we still have some things to do trade-wise, maybe motioning a little bit. Let's start off with the quarterback position. They have Deshaun Kaiser, Cody Kessler, and Kevin Hogan on roster. You have no veteran at all. 
And Hugh Jackson's there. Todd Haley is there. Todd Haley, not a bad offensive coach by any stretch. He's not a good one per se, especially situationally. But he at least sets his players up to succeed, especially the elite players. That's why you see Le'Veon Bell get a ton of targets, Antonio Brown, etc. So, quarterback. We have options. We have a lot of options. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo, let's say he and Drew Brees are off the table. That they're getting re-signed by their team. That's fair. So, we have as options at the quarterback position. Let's start off with that. Um, We will also mention Tyrod Taylor and Alex Smith. Both of them are under contract, but both of them most likely will not be with the team that they are on right now come next season. I think Kirk Cousins is an interesting one as well. Well, Cousins is a free agent. I'm going to get to those. Yeah, but I'm saying it's throw into the mix. Kirk Cousins, Sam Bradford, um, Teddy Bridgewater, Case Keenum. uh, AJ McCarron is a restricted free agent. If I'm on the Browns, and I know the Browns tried to trade for him already... (laughs) tried um this season yeah don't don't go after aj mccarron please it'd be another no. dumpster fire absolutely disaster of a situation i i think if you're going quarterback you i'm gonna cross out a couple names sam bradford teddy bridgewater injury concerns you are not in a position to gamble right now it's just not on the table um you have to you have to guarantee a quarterback this year Whomever it is, they have to be the guy. So those two guys are off the table for me. But looking at some of the other names. So let's say it is Kirk Cousins, Alex Smith, Tyrod Taylor, or drafting a quarterback. I think you definitely do both, uh, if you can, for drafting a quarterback and signing a veteran. I think your best bet for success is, is Kirk Cousins. I think he's the best of the three. And that's not okay. to say that I, I value Kirk Cousins with such high esteem. Um, I think Alex Smith is the second best option. And then Tyrod Taylor. Despite me thinking that Tyrod Taylor really is a better quarterback than, than, both. than both of those guys. I, I think, and I know a lot of people disagree with that. It's Sorry. The st- it's my the stability. Opinion. Yeah. Um, uh, Alex Smith might be the best fit. Yeah. So I want to make a definitive, let, let, this is going to be what we come together with. We're the front office, the two of us. We're making yes. this decision, so we have to agree on it. Um, Kirk Cousins is going to demand 25 to $30 million a year. And you have it. But are you willing to spend it, or would you rather get Alex Smith, whom the Chiefs might not trade? Let's, let's go with the example that they are willing to trade him to us. Like, the Patriots were not willing to move Garoppolo to the Browns. Let's say that Alex Smith is on the table for us. Let's say they won a third-round pick. He'll be in the final year of his contract, and he is a veteran mentor-type quarterback. Is he a guy that we feel more comfortable with or spending a ton of money on Cousins with a lot of outs? If we're going to to double-dip, is it better to have the bridge or the guy and a fallback? I personally wouldn't want to give up a third uh, in order to acquire Alex Smith, and I know, and I know Alex Smith is worth a third. I think for the Browns in this situation, but if you can get Kirk Cousins for extra money that you have more than enough of, um, I feel like w- why not? So let's say we can structure. He, his he contract. does give you an out. It's not a waste. Yeah, let's say we can structure his contract a little bit. Um, just taking a look at other quarterback contracts in general. Um, most of them don't have a ton of guaranteed money. Even Matthew, St- Derek Carr is a good example. Only uh, out of his $125 million contract, only 32% is guaranteed. So let's say we take a look at this contract. Um, the Raiders have outs after 2019, which is... <laughs> So, pretty early. Yeah, they have outs 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. Um, dead money would be 7.5, but they have 15 mil in savings at 2019. So it's really early. Let's say we structure a contract like that. Would you be willing to give Kirk Cousins, um, let's say, $135 million overall with... Let's see. What did Carr get as a signing bonus? Carr We're talking got, five or six here. Like that's a big five, contract. Five, five years. 
Okay. Five, five years. Um, Carr got 70 total mil in guarantees. Um, that That's total if he survives through different things. Um, let's say with a decent signing bonus. I, I'd probably say yes. I'd say Cousins would be the best option here. Yeah, I mean, I, I talked about it earlier with, I think Tyrod's the best quarterback. I think Smith or Cousins makes the most sense. Yeah. Uh, and probably Cousins is the best between Smith and and himself. Yeah, I, I'd be willing to do that. I mean, the Browns have all the money in the world. Yeah. The, the other thing, though, if we trade for Alex Smith, we can do that prior to free agency. So we can use that as a guarantee for a for other impending free agents. Would Alex Smith be enough of a draw for an Allen Robinson? My answer is no. I don't think so at all. But I think Kirk Cousins definitely could be. Yes. And I think absolutely if, could I, be. I think if we're putting it out there, out of all the teams, we're the ones who could offer the most money. And if you, if we can guarantee for two years of guaranteed money for Kirk Cousins without after year three. I think we could I think it'll be worth it to do that because the upfront number would look terrible. But I think if he performs at that level, he'll be an average paid quarterback by the time that the contract would expire or we can get rid of him. So by the time cap starts to crunch a little bit, which I don't think will happen too often, I'd say Kirk Cousins is probably the best bet. So let's pencil him in. I'm going to write this down, okay? Um, what what would be the terms for you? Third year out, how much money for five years? Uh, I think 135 is a little steep. I'd probably shave 10 off that. And uh, I don't even think he's he's worth that, but I think that'd be the contract that he would demand and probably get. Browns, they have so much cap room. They can afford to make this move and you know overpay for something you want rather than underpaying and not getting it. I'm going to say 130. Is that fair? Meet in the I'll meet you in the middle. Yeah. Okay. 130, third year out, over five. Okay, so that's number one. First things first, that's the first big move for us. Okay, so now we have Kirk Cousins. We've guaranteed we get our quarterback, at least one of our quarterbacks. So now we are down, let's say, first year, because usually in these contracts they are uh, – they're, they're about accurate. Let's say 25 mil because we have the cap. We can, we can afford that. We mm -hmm. come in right now. We've signed Kirk Cousins. We have, let's see, that would be 85 mil in cap space left. Okay. Yeah, an egregious amount, you could yeah. say. So we have 85 mil in cap, and we are taking a look at different positions. So what's the next need? We have currently, we have Duke Johnson Jr. at running back. Isaiah Crowell is a free agent. We Crow have. I don't want to resign Isaiah Crowell yeah, for a yeah. number of reasons. I agree. So we're just going to pencil him out. He's gone. Um, Duke Johnson, I like. Duke Johnson needs some help. Yes. Whether that's a need for us in free agency or the draft, I don't know. Yeah, and I think you're right. Um, I think probably the draft, considering the running back class. Um, yes, I think you're right as well. But there, I'm going to propose something as a possibility. So Let's hear it. Let's get to that in a second. I just want to run through the roster real quick. Fair. Um, it's Josh Gordon. It is Corey Coleman. It is Rashard Hollywood Higgins, uh, Ricardo Lewis. Is that what they're calling him, Hollywood? Yeah, he's been called that for a while. Um, I hadn't heard that. Then you have David Njoku. You have Seth Safety DeValve. You have Randall Telfer. And you have a really good offensive line, but you need a right tackle. Right tackle is a severe weakness and has been since Mitchell Schwartz left. Um, so... With all of those things put together, I mean, Sean Coleman could develop, but he's not there yet. Let's just put that there. So with those things considered, we need a running back to pair with Duke Johnson. We need that that actual workhorse back. We need another wide receiver. We need a right tackle. It might not even hurt to get two wide receivers, honestly. And we're still looking at a quarterback in the draft. So let's start with running back. Um, running backs on the board as of right now. Le'Veon Bell, Eddie Lacy, Darren Sproles, Shane Vereen, Frank Gore, Burkhead, uh, Jamal Charles, Terrence West, Alfred Morris, Lance Dunbar, Deion Lewis, LeGarrette Blunt, Orleans Darkwa, Jeremy Hill, Carlos Hyde, um, Benny Cunningham, Andre Ellington, uh, Christine Michael, Jarek McKinnon, K. 
Ken John Barner, Kerwin Williams, Teron Ward, Alex Collins is an ERFA, Thomas Rawls is an RFA, um, Zach Zenner is an RFA. So would you be willing to pay Le'Veon Bell $15 million a season? I don't think he's going to be available, but okay. yes. If, if Hypothetically, yes. I don't okay. think he's going to be available. I think they're going to franchise tag him again, and I well, think that he's not going to play. probably, yeah. Okay. So won't retire though. Yeah. So okay, let's cross off Bell. Uh, looking at the other options: Burkhead, Dion Lewis, Legarrette. I don't. Blunt. I don't like Dion Lewis or Rex Burkhead because I think they serve a similar purpose to uh, what ideally Duke Johnson would do. So. A guy like LeGarrette Blunt makes a lot of sense to me. Eddie Lacy most certainly would not. Yeah, uh, he's too injury prone, a little too slow for me. Um, honestly, I think Deion Lewis is an all-around back this, at this point. I think he has unbelievable vision. I, I don't know if he would be a guy that I would want to depend on. I don't think he is a typical, and I know, you know not everyone has to be typical, but like, he's not that bell cow running back that can yeah. get the ball you know, 15 to 25 times a game. And I know 25 is obviously at the long end of that. Yeah. You don't see a lot of uh, running backs get that many carries anymore. But still, when you're a smaller player like he is, taking as many hits as he would in these situations, getting yeah. handoffs, I don't like it. He has a so. condensed frame, and he has great vision, which both of those are definitely benefits. But I'd probably say that I would pass because I think he's also going to demand too much money. Um, I think he'll sign a pretty good deal at New England, but if not, he could get 6 or $7 million a year on the open market, in my belief. Which, if we're not getting a Le'Veon Bell, I don't really want to spend that much money on a running back. Um, I think we could get LeGarrette Blunt for 2 mil. I think that would be a an option. I don't know if he would leave Philadelphia, but with Jay Ajayi there, I think it's a possibility. Mm. So, would you be okay with LeGarrette Blunt adding him to the running back room as a rotational piece? I think 2 is a little bit low. Well, he I signed he, a one point, uh, yeah, one point and, two, and then he had another solid season, and yeah. I, he's shown that once he gets ahead of steam, there's not a player that can tackle him in this league. But he's also um, going to be thirty two. I think that he would get more like two and a half or three. Okay. Um, even at this stage, if it's only a one year deal. You'd but be okay I, with three mil. Yeah, but I still don't necessarily want to sign a running back. I know you need more depth there. I'm thinking probably at the lower end, more like that one mil range. I think LeGarrette Blunt is just going to get more than that. Okay. Um, so who would you consider? Would you... Would you like, not... I want to draft a running back if I'm yeah. Cleveland. So would you rather just hold off and go running back in the draft and not even pick someone up? You well, have Duke and the, you have... the depth is so shallow right now if we're letting Crowell go. Yeah. And we only have Duke Johnson. You have Matthew They're... Gaze as well. But he's not, he's not a real he's not a running back he's more of a return man he he's more of a third down guy at most but um, would you want to wait till after the draft to see who's still left and try to pick someone off of up off the scrap heat if need be well let's go with that I think that's probably the best option okay so let's move on to wide receiver um, Terrell Pryor is going to be back on the open market after a disastrous season his value could not be lower um, Mike Wallace Sammy Watkins. Uh, Decker, I'm I'm just crossing out Decker. I mean, yeah, there's no no, no Eric help. Decker. Uh, Taylor Gabriel, interesting. He was a former Brown. They moved on from him in favor of Andrew Hawkins. Um, Dontrell Inman, Kamar Aiken, uh, Danny. I'm trying to think of how these players would complement the core that's currently there, but you just know so little about some of these players, considering that yeah. the top receivers slated don't even play. Josh yeah. Gordon, Corey Coleman, whether injuries or we'll say. Um, extracurricular activities for Josh Gordon. Yeah. Allen Robinson. Allen Robinson is the best receiver on the open market, I think, without a doubt. Sammy Watkins has potential, and he's up there. But but, I, but he is another you know, injury guy. Yeah, Allen Robinson is just purely the best. And even though Allen Robinson was out for the season, I don't think he's a particularly injury-prone player. Yeah, I agree. So let's um, not even add that to the mix. So now my question is, do you believe that they that we could get him? I think that the 49ers are going to draw. be. I think the 49ers are going to be where he ends up to pair with Jimmy Garoppolo. I think that would be the best, be fun. best, best fit for not, him. Not for us because we're with the Browns yeah. right now, so that wouldn't yeah. be fun. No, but it would be fun to watch. It, it would be yeah, unfortunate as for a us. non-Browns front office. Yeah, um, I think we're going to have to. I'd say we should double up here. 
I think the first player we should go after is we should bring back Terrell Pryor. I think that's a, that's a fair play. And then I think a player not like him at all, I think Taylor Gabriel would be an excellent addition. You think, think he would he, come back to Cleveland? I think uh, unless he, he was treated real poorly by us, we'll say. Yeah. I think it's certainly on the table, especially if the money's right. If they I, say, hey, you yeah. know what, just want to go a different route. He'd be a fun slot receiver. Yeah, and that, that's what I'd like to play. Or, and I know this seems like a weird one, but as far as a direct player that we'd have to fill one role, Dontrell Inman. Yeah, He's Jarvis a Landry body. as well, by the way. Is a I, don't, I don't want to bring Jarvis Landry in. I think he'll want too much money. I, yes. that, I just I just wanted to mention him because I didn't want people to think we forgot him. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's say Pryor first. Let's start with that. So Pryor, I'm in on Terrell Pryor. Um, what he's making six million dollars. Um, his value probably should be about the same. Think uh, two years, six to fourteen mil around. How old is he right now? How old is he? He is currently. I would say he's twenty eight. That's, that's, that would might be my guess. I I think that's for two years. I think that's probably fair. Yeah. What would you say? Three years, twenty one with ten guaranteed. I wouldn't. I wouldn't offer a three year on him, okay. just considering what we saw this past year. But you know, I think that two years is a fair amount of time till he's thirty. Um, and if, then if he only accepts a one year, what would you value that at? Maybe a bit higher, but so want to say one year eight with uh or two or do you want to just go two years 14 and well let's get like 10 prove, guaranteed prove, prove a deal one year eight yeah okay so one year eight so we'll get prior in we'll get the six four guy back obviously he's with kirk cousins again they didn't have a ton of chemistry but it might have been the offense might have just not been a good fit you know, we'll, we'll see I didn't what even think about that. I, I forgot we had Kirk Cousins. I, I, I personally think he maybe he likes Kirk Cousins. You know, yeah, well, I mean, he went to Washington to team with him. Yeah. So, and unless something you know bad happened, which I mean, I guess his numbers weren't great, and yeah, I mean, he didn't really fit the offense at all. Yeah, and obviously Josh Doxson emerged to replace the role that he would have filled anyway. But um, Pryor could be a, a nice big body to go with him. Um, low risk deal. It's a very low risk deal. Um, and do you want to go Inman? Would you rather go? Um, I think want... Inman fills a role. He's Gabriel, like right? a yeah, real the... budget. Uh, Allen Robinson, real budget. I think would... I think Dontrell Inman makes sense. But would you rather him or Gabriel? Because well, we, we'll already, Gabriel we already have Gordon. Yeah. So um, Gabriel would be a fourth move piece for us. That's probably not a bad option. I just you brought up a good point that I didn't think about, which is like you know, would he go back to the Browns? And I'm really not sure. Um, but, yeah, I, I, we do need slot. We'll assume that he'd be willing to sign for the money. Let's say, so, yeah. let's say, uh, wait, we'll, like five. We'll go five. I'd say. Let's see how old is Terrell or Gabriel? He's Gabriel, pretty young. I'd say he's 26. 26. He's 26. Um, he's making 2.7 right now. What would you say? Uh, two years, 12. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So if he accepts, we'll go with that. You know, this is all speculation for what guys would be accepting of. But two mm-hmm. years, 12 is a lot more money than he would have gotten otherwise. So we have four wide receivers on roster. We have Gordon, we have Coleman, we have Pryor, we have Gabriel. That's insurance for both of them to fill because I think that Gabriel could fill an outside role the same way Coleman does if need be. And I think Pryor could fill Gordon's role if need be. So we yeah. have now Coleman who could shift into the slot or we could put Gordon in the slot as a big slot because he's capable of doing that. So I like the way that our wide receiving core is putting up together. Um, obviously, Marquise Lee is another option that we could consider, but I like Taylor Gabriel's speed and gadget ability a little bit more. Uh, Marquise Lee's a fine player, but I wouldn't necessarily want to pay him. So let's say that's another 14 mil down. So we're up to 71 mil right now after okay. we've made those three pieces. Um, offensive line. Let's see if there's any offensive linemen who we would want to go after. We um, want to sign a, a tackle. No one on the defensive line, potentially a linebacker, and then a, a safety. Yeah. I think let's not splurge in free agency, even though we kind of already have yeah. to a degree. But um, uh, necessary. I don't really see any right tackles worth anything. Um, Donald Stevenson, Andre Smith, Chris Clark, Brown Giacomini, Gilliam, Byron Bell, Cameron Fleming. 
It's a lot of players past their prime. Yeah, or, or Fleming, which is not great. Um, Solder is an option, but he's left tackle, and I wouldn't want to move him at this point in his career. Um, no one else really fits the bill. I think we could live with Sean Coleman as of right now. We yeah. could always draft an offensive tackle in the draft in the second round. We have the pieces for it. So let's go to the defensive side. We're happy with our tight ends, right? DeValve, Najoku, Telfer. We're good with them? Yeah, that's fine. That's a fine okay. group. So let's go to the defensive side. Um, no down linemen really on the radar. Um, linebackers, do you want to look at 4-3 outside backers, inside backers? Yeah, let's check that out. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Derek Johnson, Puzlozny, Minter, Whitehead, Bradham, McCl- Rolando McLean. Uh, these are not guys who I'm feeling very confident about. I would love uh, that. Nigel Bradham's an interesting one, and despite his yearly gun charge, he's a really good player. He is a really good player, but I don't think, you know, we, we have Collins, we have um, we have Schobert, we have Kirksey. I, I don't know how good Joe Schobert actually is, because I, I know he level can tackles. I'm not a huge fan of that stat. Um, well, yeah, it is valuable. I don't think he played particularly well, though. And I know that seems weird to people, but yeah, well, here's a player doesn't that mean playing well. Here's a player I would consider. Honestly, at this point, I would like a coverage linebacker more than anything, and I think you could put Jabril Peppers into the box to fill that role if need be. Just as a thought, put Kindred, okay. put Kindred at strong safety, keep him there, and you go with a guy like. Uh, to Peppers as a money backer in that defensive Yeah, yeah, yeah. just move this uh, system around a little bit. But I think that could be something that's possible. We obviously saw that Greg Williams used Mark Barron in that role. So yep. what would you say? Do you think it might not be worth going after a, a linebacker with that in mind? Um, that's that's definitely a fair statement. Every, Avery Williamson, by the way, is the guy who I was looking at. as a potential. That's another fun player. I wasn't aware that he was a, uh, He's a pending UFA. free agent. UFA. Okay. So yeah, we could definitely. Yeah. Um, I think we can have a discussion about him, but I don't think it's a priority right now. Let's look at safety first. That's fair. Um, we'll look at corner as well. Corner and safety. So corner, obviously, Trumaine Johnson. Um, he fit very I'm well. I'm not willing with... to pay him. He commands way too much money for I have no idea why. That's like, he's, a, he's a decent player, but yeah, he gets so much, and I, I really don't know what he's earned to make that money. Okay, that's fair. What he's um, done to earn that for a a scheme that requires very demanding physical capabilities. He's there aren't. That he's like what six two. Something yeah. Like that. Well, no, I mean from a speed perspective, you need to be able to have great change of direction in this type of scheme because you have to play a lot of off coverage. You have to be put in a lot of cushion situations and have the physical profile, have those open hips. Um, Morris Claiborne, Malcolm Butler. Um, Kyle Fuller, I don't think Fuller's going to leave. I, I just, I can't see it. He's going to get paid big money, and he's a really good player. Malcolm Butler's kind of a fun one. He is, but I'm afraid that he's going to want too much. I'm not willing to pay him $12 million a year. Yeah. Um, Morris true. Claiborne could be an interesting one. Claiborne uh, had a really Mo- good year. I don't like him, Claiborne. I just, I, <laughs> his, is, his first part of his career up until last, and I guess this year, was so bad. I know, but the past two years have been really good. But I don't want to. I don't want to bank. I, he, I maybe maybe a small deal in terms he, of years. Signed, We've been he adding... signed a four point seven mil year. That that's what he had with the Jets this year. Would you be willing to? I mean, this would be a rotational corner, so I don't know if it's necessary. I think it would probably be better to draft somebody. Yeah, to I'm, fill I'm, a role. I don't want to. I just wanted to bring him up. So let's look at safety. Let's look at safety. Morgan Burnett, TJ Ward, Kenny Vaccaro, Eric Reed, um, Michael Thomas as a gunner, uh, Lamarcus Joyner. Lamarcus well, Joyner is a fun one. I love Lamarcus Joyner. You know how he's I feel a about really him. good player. He is an excellent player, and he has experience at nickel corner and free safety. I so, don't think the other options really lend to what our needs are currently. Yeah. Which is really a, a true free safety, and yeah, Lamarcus Joyner's played a ton of, of nickel, um, so and that fills both needs technically. Yeah. So if we, I think Lamarcus Joyner's pretty much a must sign. I, I think he is too, and Greg Williams knows him well. So that's true. That's a system that he knows, that Williams knows, 
If he likes Greg Williams, that's a really good deal uh, for us. I'm going to say, what, what would you be willing to pay? Um, average per year. What, based on He's his play. Worth probably at least six, unfortunately. Um, let's see. I, he deserves more than Cyprian. He deserves more than Church. I'd say he's probably about a seven, seven mil a year guy. I think he's probably in the range of what Deshaun Gibson got. Um, Gibson got thirty six over five, which is about seven point two per year. Let's offer him the same exact contract. Another young player. I, I'd say we offer him a little bit more. Let's offer him thirty eight over five. Okay. Just just to show that we care more about him than we would have for Deshaun Gibson. Um, Tony Jefferson was a guy who we had considered in the past, but um, he opted to sign with the Ravens. So yeah. that was a whole separate issue. But um, So number four, th- uh, Joyner fills the role of free safety and also serves as another nickel corner if need be. You can use him as a movable chess piece. And I'm going to say for him, he's going to be a guy 38 over 5. Okay. So... That puts us down to about six, uh, 65 mil right now, which is still plenty. Still plenty. Um, I don't think we need to go after anybody else in free agency. I'm probably under that same agreement. I think we addressed positions, ton of draft picks. Yes. Time to get some of those players involved. Yes. So we have the we have the draft picks that we need that we can do that sort of thing. Um, Joiner is fantastic. Being the free safety, he has the range, he has the capability. I, I really like his fit for this team. Um, so, moving on into the draft, I think let's just go over the needs real quick. We've addressed quarterback, but quarterback is still a need, even with Kirk yes. Cousins. Yes. Uh, although I'm not sure I would, I would take one with the first overall pick. Still, I think there's definitely a conversation for that. Running back, I think for sure, definitely still a need. Um, I think we could definitely draft a wide receiver. Right tackle. In this draft, right tackle for sure. And then... Strong safety is still an issue. I'm I think gonna, safety I think safety that. still in general. Yeah, I think I think what Joyner can do is very valuable, but I think you can move him around in a lot of different places. So, I think cornerback and I think linebacker. Yeah, um, and right tackle, if I didn't mention that. Yeah, and then maybe a, uh, another situational edge. Yeah. So, I mean, we have plenty of needs. You know, this is not a refined roster. So, number one overall pick. We can go quarterback, we can go running back, we can trade down. I don't want to trade down for any of these picks, per se. I want to just stick with where we're at, just for the sake of continuity, if that's okay with you. That's fair. That's Um, fair. So, we are in the front office. We have our choice of quarterback. We have our choice of overall player. Um, do I think that Saquon Barkley is worth the number one overall pick for this team? My answer is no. I think that quarterback is too important long term. I think that if you're going, if we're going to go quarterback, we can go Sam Darnold here or Josh Rosen, one or the other young players. Um, yeah, let's take Sam Darnold. I, I don't like Darnold that much, but he's a developmental yeah, player. Me neither. I don't think he's going to develop into much, unfortunately for him. So, I mean, we could go we could go running back right here. I mean, this is really we have our quarterback. This is not a position of need anymore at number one. It could be a position. It could be a need at number four, but yeah. there's no chance that Rosen, Darnold, and Mayfield will all be gone. By number four. Kirk Cousins on a, what, five-year deal? Five-year deal, third year out. There's absolutely no reason to to take a quarterback here. There's no reason to. I agree. I think you pencil in Saquon Barkley. I I think Barkley is the guy. I'd I'd also consider Minka. That number one. To play outside corner. To play a Jalen Ramsey type role, the way that, just looking at what Jalen Ramsey has done for that Jaguars defense, I'd feel very, very conflicted not taking him, because I think there's a lot of transformative running backs in this class, and while Saquon Barkley is excellent, I think he profiles a little bit similarly to Duke Johnson in the overall scheme of things, which I'm not going to say it's a bad thing. I think he's better as a runner, for sure, but... I think Barkley's excellent. Don't get me wrong. I think he's excellent. 
but I don't know if I can justify taking a quarterback, a running back, number one. It's just a tough sell. He's the best player in the class. He's a generational type player. And Minka Fitzpatrick may be the best overall defensive back in the class. Maybe he's the best overall defensive back. Yeah. Yeah, there are debatably better outside corner options than to take a potential a uh, better safety fit. And he could play strong safety, maybe. Um, even though maybe that's Derek Kindred, maybe that's somebody else. Saquon Barkley, I can tell you right now, there are teams right behind that could draft Saquon Barkley in an instant in an instant in the New York Giants, in the Indianapolis Colts. The risk a reward team that is definitely trades up. there. The risk reward is there. But would those teams take Minka Fitzpatrick? Would the Giants? Probably not. The Giants wouldn't, but the Colts might. If they don't trade down. Yeah, the, the Colts might. They took Malik Hooker last year, and if they plan on playing Minka as a safety, he probably translates best as a free safety. Yeah. Well, now my question becomes, is it easier to find another defensive back later? I feel like, yes. Because how many, how many running backs that we see in the draft are guys that have, you know, their fifth round draft picks and they excel to start them the way that, you know, some cornerbacks. Not, not a ton. Not as many. Not as yeah. many. Because what, what's more important as a running back is that physical profile. Yeah. Um, I would say Saquon Barkley here is the pick. I think Minka might be there at four. Minka might be there for if we want to go Minka, and I'm not even sold on Minka Fitzpatrick for the Browns at this spot. Yeah. I, I, I think Saquon Barkley. You know what? I'll agree with you. I think that he transforms the offense, and he makes everything easier. I think with that offensive line, with all of the tools, Todd Haley is going to love this kid. He's a, he's a gamer. He loves the game. Let, let's go Saquon Barkley, number one. Let's just... I'm in. I'm in. Okay. So, number one, Barkley. Well, now we got to go into mock draft mode pretty much. Yeah. So, Who are the next two off the board? Number two, I'm saying is Rosen. I think he's going here to the Giants. Yeah, I would agree. Um, number in, three. In this spot, we'll say that. And I think, I think next up is Bradley Chubb. I think Chubb is probably going to be the pick, but I could also see them moving down. Um, well, we're going to keep for the sake of continuity. Okay. We'll, we'll keep it the same. Keep, we'll keep it as is. Okay. So number, th number, two, uh, number three is Chubb. So now we still have our choice. We have Mayfield on the board, Darnold still around, we have Minka still around, we have other players who are still in the picture here. Um, right. I'm gonna we, I'm gonna give you my pick my pitch right here. Okay. Um, number four, Kirk Cousins is what we decided to be our franchise quarterback. Correct. There's no reason to take a quarterback here with Agreed. Kirk Cousins, and we do have an out after year three. Okay. Oh, that means we could take someone next year, or we could take, or, or we could let Kaiser develop even. Yeah, that that's what second round pick last year. Yep. He showed certainly the physical attributes of a talented quarterback. Maybe he needs to refine those things. Maybe now a Todd Haley, who's worked with a Big Ben Roethlisberger, he could come in here. Yep. You know, coach him to success as that backup, learning under Kirk Cousins, another guy who's done that. Yep. Knows what that's like. Yeah. And has succeeded as a and, starter. And, and a very good person. Probably, I don't know his his teaching capabilities, but it, having a veteran who's go, gone through the ringer plenty of times in a bunch of different roles definitely could help Kaiser. Plus, Kaiser's confidence could definitely rise back up, which is something that is uh, obviously a huge issue for him this season. Um, so what's your pitch for number four? I'm going to tell you, uh, I'll get there. I'll tell you right <laughs> now, I maybe don't want a quarterback in this entire draft. That's I think fine. that that makes a ton of sense with, with what we've done so far. With, and with what Kessler, with Kaiser, and with Cousins on roster, and Hogan as yeah. of right now. I, I think I'm Hogan likely that. will stay. I think Kessler likely will stay. This could be a four-quarterback roster. There's no reason to take one. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think as much as you seem to like Micah Fitzpatrick, and as much as he would make sense here, kind of, at number four, I think he fits best as a safety at the next level. And I think as far as outside cornerbacks go, you don't have to be put into a box. And, and I know he's a really solid player, um, and he can play safety, he can play cornerback, but you're drafting him to play outside cornerback over there, yeah. I guess, on that left side, or if he travels, oh, I whatever. Know, I know what you're about to say. Yeah, you absolutely do. I'll work it out to it. I, 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 know, what's about to, I know what's about to come. 
why would you not take the best defensive player in the draft to lead your defense? Roquan We've seen Smith. the San Francisco 49ers do the same thing and build the most successful defense in the NFL over that time period, arguably, with at least Willis in terms of the front seven, yep. with Patrick Willis, with Navarro Bowman. You take Roquan Smith, the best defensive player in the draft. All over the field, middle linebacker. With he is a coverage speed, guy with extra strength, instincts. Coverage fluidity, instincts, team leadership, box-to-box range as a linebacker. And he has no red flags. Absolutely none. I, the, here's a guy that you look at and you don't say, all right, what was the problem with Ruben Foster last year? It's off-the-field concerns and maybe tackling technique. Um, yeah. And, and the fact Smith. that he doesn't know any X's and O's. <laughs> That's true. With Roquan Smith, he's out there. He's telling other players what to do. He's out there making the plays. He's got excellent, excellent tackling for him, in my opinion. Um, again, box to box. Yeah. Fluid in coverage. This is a guy that can do it all. No off the field stuff. You don't look at him and say, all right, here's a, we- a real weakness of his. Everything he does at a high level, he's the best defensive player in the draft over Bradley Chubb, over Mick Fitzpatrick, over anyone else you can think of. It's Roquan Smith at number four to transform this defense, take it from, you know, already a top run defense to to make it even better. But now they can cover more. And Kirksey, too, being able to be healthy and company, that'll help with coverage as well. But Roquan will transform that defense. I agree. I'm I'm on board. I'm I'm on board. Let me take Roquan Roquan at number four. All right, let's pencil him in. I love the way this team is shaping up. Because it looks really, really good. Leaders everywhere. And now, guess what team also has three top picks? Well, I, I will say two top picks in the second round, and then um, it's still a somewhat high pick at 63 um, overall. So let, let's scroll down a little bit. Let's say um, guys are, are going here left and right. What's a next position of need? I think we need to go defensive back. I think we need to address outside cornerback, probably. Yes. Um, outside corners, anyone who you would have in mind that would still be there? Um, I think that maybe two will go in the first round. This isn't an especially talented cornerback class as far as I've seen. Yeah. And I think on the board right now could be a Dante Jackson out of LSU. He's a guy that jumps to mind for me. Um, Mike Hughes out of UCF was a good player. Isaiah I think maybe, Oliver, Colorado. Yeah, that's, that's another one. Um I think I would want to add some height into that secondary because LaMarcus Joyner, and I, he's at safety. He's a smaller guy. Brand Buddy Calhoun's a guy who's who's got some size. Jason McCourty's not going to be there forever. Yeah. But if we can really work with this physical blend, um, get the guys with you know a height speed, I yeah. think Carlton Davis out of Auburn makes a ton of sense here. Yeah. Uh, he's a guy six foot one, has decent speed. Um, I'm a big fan of his. Change of direction is so big in this in this mm-hmm. uh, scheme. If he can do that at a high level, then I'm on board. So, okay. who would you say? Because I haven't gotten a chance to look too deep into this. I I know that we're going corner, but let let's yeah. just we don't need to pick specific players because it's really only speculation at this point. Well, let's give a couple of options here yeah. then. So um, let's say Oliver. Let's say Carlton Davis. Um, as, and I as think the throw Dante two. Jackson in the mix. He's a guy that's. Uh, Okay. I had a rise on my board at least because of how I think he's going to test and how he's um, transitioned yeah. with LSU this year because he wasn't supposed to be their top cornerback by any means. Yeah. And then he kind of excelled into that role of being their lockdown guy. And, you know, we, we've seen some guys out of LSU that have been very successful at LSU and then, you know, in the league and, and vice versa with a guy like Bo Claiborne. But, yeah. They are arguably the new DBU. You look at Tredavious White this year. Maybe yeah. Dante Jackson's the next guy in that range. I mean, hey, I'm, I'd be okay with it. You know, as long as we add a guy who can really transform this defense, I am absolutely okay with it. I think we already drafted that transformative player, yeah. and now we're just trying to add more pieces in. Uh, um, but, you know, yeah, some of these guys are the obvious question marks. So let's take a look at offensive tackle here. Um, I don't know who plays on which side as of right now. Okay. But uh, a lot of left tackles in this class. Orlando Brown's a guy that 
um, could be really, really solid. I think he can play at the right on the right side. Um, well, there's two names that come to mind who have excelled at the Senior Bowl. Okay, uh, Brian O'Neill and Alex Kappa. Kappa from Humboldt State. Uh, and O'Neill out of Pitt. Yeah, both of those guys have dominated so far at uh, at the Senior Bowl. And then two guys on the edge who I would definitely consider in this spot are going to be, of course, Darnes Armstrong Jr. Okay. And Okoronkwo. I was going to say Oba Okoronkwo as well. I'm a huge Obanaya Okoronkwo guy. Um, watched him terrorize teams in the Big 12. I'm a Big 12 guy. Yeah. Love Texas. But that's a player when you watch Oklahoma, you're like, wow, he's not getting the hype that he deserves, but he is all over the place at edge. Yeah. Uh I think you can have a NASCAR package with someone like him. You can yeah, you can uh, move you can move Garrett inside on third down, put Okoronkwo on the edge and just go to go to town on third down. I think down. it's it's a really interesting situation. Um because Dorrance Armstrong Jr., he's a guy that had excellent pass rush productivity yeah. 2 years ago and he was awesome at stopping the run. And this is already a very good uh run stuffing defense. Yeah, but I'm I'm not sure. Dorrance Armstrong has proven in the past that he can get, um, he can get to the pressure or he can get pressure on the QB. Yeah. So I am not really sure what the look is here. Arden Key is also a guy. Who, yeah, if, if he's, who is falling. If he, yeah, because he has off the field stuff. Yeah, but he's another um, talented player. Um, yeah, really good athletic profile. Yeah. Uh, he's huge, very fast as well. I, I'm gonna pose one more player to you. Okay. Complete curveball, James Washington. At wide receiver, deep threat, interesting. I think he is, I think we still, we have a deep threat. We have possibly two. Pryor is a guy who can play that role. Uh, Gordon obviously is that guy. But James Washington, because you know what? Maybe Corey Coleman is not the answer. Maybe it's time to start phasing him out. He's going into year three already. He has shown very little through these first two years. He's been injured, but... We have a couple flyers in prior. We have a flyer in Gabriel. We don't need to depend on either of them. If James Washington is still there, that's a guy who I think is one of the best players in this draft period. He is so unbelievably talented. And he's just a guy who could transform this team in a different way. I mean, the real question for him is that he plays in a scheme that isn't great, but He's looked great at the Senior Bowl. He is excellent at the point of contact. I think he's going to rise up boards, unfortunately, especially yeah. with all this saying, because that was the only question was, can he do this in a different system, and can he be effective at the next level? Because we know he can do it at college. He's also small, um, though. In that system. He's 5'11". I, I got to say, I think that he will already be gone at this point. Okay. With some of the uh, receiver needy teams, because I think a team like the Ravens could easily – take him bears as well i'm gonna say i would prefer an edge rusher here okay and it's it's all about seeing who's available because maybe my favorite edge rusher in the class is cleveland Farrell out of clemson yeah and he could be very well could be on the board at this spot i don't think he will be i, think I don't think so either but um whether it be I don't armstrong or key or uh hercules matafa or okoronkwo or, I mean, even Davenport, he's a little raw. I don't know if I would take him this high at all. Um, he has not looked good against higher-level competition, so that's an issue. But want to just pencil in edge at 35 and move on? All right, let's do that. Okay, because we're running a little late. Okay, um, yeah, I, mean, I didn't even realize the time. Having so much fun with the Browns. Yeah, so let's go with the last... Uh, the last second rounder, and then we'll just speculate a little bit. I think here we have to go offensive line. Yes. So let's say right tackle um, or offensive tackle, because we still need a Joe Thomas potential replacement as well on roster. And I am not sold on Spencer Durango <laughs> as anything. So you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so 63 goes OT. And 65, I think we need to go safety. Okay, I, I'm not really all too familiar with the safety class as far as, like, I have some names in mind, but, yeah. you know, I don't know who's going to be there. I know a guy that I've talked a lot about that would fill a very big need who could be available in this range, Deshaun Elliott out of Texas. 
I mean, that, he'll be excellent. He would be an excellent pick. I mean, he, he might he might exactly be, what they need. He might end up being a top, uh, a first round pick at some point. So I don't know if he'll be there. He but. could be. I've seen a, a lot of places project him as a round two. But you know what? They, they need a playmaker. So I'm okay putting at 65 to Sean Elliott, and I'm okay if we take him at 63 instead. He's a guy that could be, or that very well could be on the board. It makes it makes sense to include him. Yeah, Deshaun Elliott or a safety. Deshaun Elliott plays safety. You mean a uh, tackle? No, or or a safety as an as a different safety. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. I think he would be the guy who I would be more comfortable with at that position. Um, Armani Watts, I think, is going to go a little too high. Uh, Kazir White, you know, guys like that, I think they're going to be going a little bit higher. But um, if Elliott's there. I think we have to pull the trigger. Yeah. So the way that this would round out, let's say, let's just say we have rounded things out. Okay. We have, we've gone through our picks at this point, you know, we're getting filler a little bit, you know, we're heading into the fourth round of things. Um, let's just go position groups at this point. Yeah. So let's say we're going to get some extra depth on the offensive line. Uh, maybe another wide receiver into the mix. We might double dip on running back. Yeah. I would go with another running back, considering how deep this class is. Because you got a guy. Um, I, I well, go, you have m- multiple guys. Akram yeah. Wadley could be here. Carry on Johnson. I'm a big fan of. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of players. Ronald Jones is on the board. Maybe maybe you go him. I think Jones will be much higher, honestly. Um, yeah. But, I mean, there's there's a ton of talent at this position. Um, Nick Chubb could be a guy who falls because of the injury so could history. Sony Michelle. I think Michelle's going to think, rise at the combine. Yeah, he's going to run a really fast time. He could, he might be the second best running back in this class. Yeah. No, that's saying a lot. I still have Darius Geis there. Yeah, I'm a I big th- Darius Geis guy. Yeah, he's going to be other guys a first rounder. Um, I mean, it, it wouldn't hurt to go after a guy who could be a uh, more of a scat back. Just if we wanted to use Duke Johnson at wide receiver at some point, have another receiving back in the mix because Duke Johnson is so versatile. Um, but you know what? Saquon Barkley is the type of guy who can do that as well. So yeah, I mean Saquon can really do it all. So yeah. so um, we could go Ballage here if he if he's falling. Um, well, we could really go a lot of different places. We don't yeah, need to. We don't need to do specifics. Many Basi- different avenues. Basically, we're going to want an extra wide receiver, an extra running back, some interior offensive line depth, um, and you know maybe um, some defensive interior depth at some point but basically that's going to wrap up our off season so let's kind of roll right through it um kirk cousins is the first thing we signed to a 130 million dollar deal over five years after the first two years we can get out of it for a minimal penalty like most of these big time deals then we take a couple flyers on terrell Pryor, one year eight um taylor gabriel two years for 12 with eight mil guaranteed then we go lamarcus joiner five years 38 mil fills a huge need on the back end and then we get to the draft we take saquon barkley number one overall we go roquan smith at number four so we add linebacker depth we add a running back we have our quarterback we go corner whether it be davis oliver or jackson at 35 we're going edge rusher depending on who's on the board uh, 63 or 65 we're going to go offensive tackle either right or left or someone who could be a swing and at 65 or 63 we're going to go to sean elliott or a safety and then we're going to fill out the roster from there with all these things in mind what do you say our record is going record to wise be? um taking a look at the way that the Bengals have kind of imploded um the way the ravens continue to age and not well and the ba- and the and the steelers with Shazier, Could question marks, obviously, apart. with Bell potentially sitting out or gone with no Todd Haley. What What do you think? What do you think we it, could do, and what's what's our ceiling? I got it. This is maybe not a team that wins the division. This is a team that's going to put in a, a damn good fight, Yeah. especially with all things considered uh, with the other teams. This ceiling, 11-win team ceiling wow uh but i think the floor is maybe is six or seven minimum i'm gonna say the floor is five because i've seen too many kirk cousins teams fall flat that's fair a lot of talent a lot of talent on those kirk cousins teams as well but i would say the ceiling is 10 wins 
I think that we're going to be in contention for the wild card. I think that would be the the best bet. Um, this team could do a turnaround like the uh, the Rams did because it's not impossible. The Rams obviously still have a lot of holes in a lot of places, but they still managed to win a ton of games because of a good offensive mind and a quarterback who could execute and a star running back. So for me, I think, uh, I think this is a team that could ac- absolutely compete, and I'd be really happy with this type of roster. So good work. Shake hands. I think so. I will uh, absolutely be calling this rebuilding the Cleveland Browns. Absolutely. This this was fantastic. I love this product. Yeah. This is this is something that we could do for more teams moving for, forward yeah. if you guys enjoy it, um, especially during the off season. But um, if there's anything else you want to add, we can uh, wrap this up. I just think yeah, this was great fun. Um, and you know, as we move into the off season here, we're we're not going to be necessarily stretched for topics, and I'm sure a little bit of prospect breakdown is going to come back. Absolutely. Um, so I'm finishing up my undergrad classes tomorrow. So I'll have a lot of time uh, back on my hands to do breakdowns and things of that nature. So we'll see more of it for sure. Yes. So content as we move it in the off season is ramping up, if anything. So stay on the lookout. If you if you don't watch it every week, you'd better start. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. Make sure to go check us out on SoundCloud and iTunes because, well, we're on both. (laughs) <laughs> might as well we listen to it on both see if the sound quality over the hour and a half is is better on one or the other or just yeah, listen to and, all of and, it. and let us know exactly uh 75 percent into the video if the uh the sound quality is better on one or the other you know make sure that you've watched it all the way through and uh yep. make sure to give us a five-star review on itunes and make sure to go check out the video portion which is going to always be on bangles channel following this uh, the show and make sure to tune in live every Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, twitch.tv backslash moonlight underscore swami. So I hope you guys enjoyed this with the Cover Two Podcast, episode number nine. For Bengal, we are the Browns. I'm Moonlight Swami. We'll be talking to you guys later. Peace. <laughs>